Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we have returned to base with a full shulker box of slime blocks, give or take the last few that we're missing from that final stack, but this only took about an hour and a half's worth of AFKing at the slime farm we built in the previous episode, which kind of goes to show that that slime farm is a little bit overpowered but that's a good thing because we didn't need to spend long at all in order to get as many slime blocks as we could reasonably need for the next little while and we might end up doing some more advanced stuff and some larger stuff with them later might even end up doing some building with them but combined with the honey blocks that we have from our honey farm over here which i'm about to go and check on this is going to kickstart a bit of a redstone revolution for us and in today's episode i'm going to recap a little bit of honey blocks and we're going to talk about slime blocks how they differ how they are similar and what potential fun we can have with both of them let's take a look yep we got plenty of honey bottles in here i'm going to turn a bunch of these into honey blocks and make sure that those go back in the dispensers to collect more honey bottles for us as long as we have at least a stack of honey blocks i think we'll be okay for today's episode we can probably make the last few of those into blocks as well perfect and then of course this is still going to be collecting honey in the background but we've got a few glass bottles to return so to begin with you'll notice some similarities between slime blocks and honey blocks they are both semi-transparent they both make particularly squishy noises and they both slow you down a little bit when you walk on them although i believe it's actually slower walking on slime than it is on honey which is weird considering honey is supposed to be the sticky one honey is the sticky one when you jump up and down on it though since you'll notice you don't end up jumping as high on honey as you do on slime and slime is definitely the bouncier of the two in fact bounciness is really one of the key properties of slime blocks we're going to build out a three by three pad here in front of the storage room i'm going to fly up to the roof and we're going to see how high we bounce jumping off of this up here we are at y 122 i believe that's down closer to y 96 or something like that if we jump off of here boing we can actually jump back up to this window just by dropping onto this without pressing any keys and then making sure that once we start bouncing we redirect our momentum up onto this ledge you'll also notice that i took no fall damage when i dropped off of this and that's one of the other properties of slime being bouncy is that it completely eliminates any fall damage you might get from jumping onto the block and there may be occasions on which you fall onto a slime block and you don't want to bounce up that high the solution to that is simply to hold down the jump button because that will cause you to do a single regular height jump once you hit the slime you'll still take no fall damage but you'll be able to exit without being bounced back up into the air again i chunk into the air again one thing to be aware of though is that if you are crouching as you fall you will still take a regular amount of fall damage falling onto slime blocks so bear that in mind if you want to land safely hold down space or just let yourself drop onto the slime blocks never hold crouch unless you're expecting to take damage from that it isn't just players that are going to bounce if they fall onto a pad of slime blocks though let's take a look at what happens to items and other entities like armor stands first of all i'm going to throw a bunch of coal down onto here since it's a fairly recognizable item and you will see <laughs> that the coal while it does obviously stack up as the items collect there it will bounce up and down on top of the slime blocks in much the same way a player will and other entities are much the same like armor stands for example those will bounce in the same way that a player will and that'll happen to other entities like creepers and cows a player who's in a boat can drive the boat off onto some slime blocks and you'll get a bit of a bounce from that but what about if you're traveling in a minecart in this case your momentum gets killed entirely the slime block actually slows down your fall and kind of breaks your fall instead of having the player bounce in the minecart we can still use slime blocks in situations with minecarts though and we'll get onto that a little later in the video one other thing to bear in mind though is that falling blocks like sand will also not bounce they will simply snap to the grid as usual and land on top of the slime blocks unless the slime block is moving because slime blocks don't just have to be static and have the player bounce off them they can also propel the player and other entities into the air in fact when pistons and sticky pistons get involved slime blocks really come into their own but before that we can also note that if you place a set of carpets over the top of some slime blocks that bouncy slime effect 
is still going to apply. And the same goes for trap doors, since they are still thin enough to allow the effects of the block below to occur to whatever is dropped on top of them. Despite the trap door normally having the properties of something solid when you drop onto it, in this case we can drop directly onto the center here and have no ill effects. We still get that bounce and we still don't take any fall damage. However, the threshold where this effect reaches its limit is with slabs. You still get the slight friction effect as you're walking around on slabs since you have slime blocks below them and that will still slow you down. You also experience an ever so slight feeling of slippiness, like it takes you a second to come to a stop, almost as though there is a little ice effect going on. Compared to walking around on normal solid blocks where you just stop instantly, the slime does have a little bit of inertia to the player's movement. But if I get back up here onto the roof and drop onto this pad of slabs now, I'm still going to take full damage. We don't get any of that bounce effect and full damage returns to being in full effect. Incidentally, that carpet effect you will find happens with honey blocks as well. Although honey blocks don't have the bounce effect that slime blocks do, the carpet will still have the same effect. You won't be able to jump around too much on honey blocks that have carpet over the top of them, and in this case, slabs are actually not enough to prevent the reduction in jump heights that you get from being on top of a honey block. It has to be a solid block in this case. So while we might be tempted to put them under the same category, that is one way in which honey blocks and slime blocks differ, their interaction with other blocks placed on top of them, and how that relates to the movement of entities walking over those blocks. You'll also find that mobs that are able to control their own flight to a certain extent don't bounce off slime blocks in the way that other mobs do. This is notable in the example of chickens. If you drop a chicken from height, it will simply flap its way safely down to the ground. And chickens don't fly around in the same way that, say, bees do, for example. But chickens will basically counteract any kind of fall from height. So anytime one of them lands on a slime block, you won't find it bouncing. It will simply stay there. Bees and other flying mobs, and allays, for example, won't really interact with slime blocks as though they have fallen onto it. But if we want to, we can still use a chicken for our next demonstration, which is launching entities using a slime block and a piston. Let's see if we can drag this chicken out of the sniffer pen here just by pillaring up a few blocks and yep, there it goes. Then we're going to bring this chicken over here and see if we can get it to jump as high as any of these frogs. We'll drop a sticky piston in the ground over here with a slime block on top of it. And it's worth noting that I haven't placed any other blocks around here attached to the slime block because much like the honey blocks that we've demonstrated before, any blocks that are attached to the slime block will travel with the slime block when the piston is activated. Now we can lead the chicken onto this slime block, we'll detach the lead, we'll unleash it, and then we'll unleash it. <laughs> and there you go. The chicken flies into the sky a few blocks and then comes to an elegant, graceful landing, and the frogs nearby are jumping in unison. <laughs> From this, you can also see that effect I mentioned, where the chickens will flap their way down to the ground safely and won't actually bounce on the slime blocks because they've eliminated any fall distance that they might have taken just by flapping down to a safe landing. If we do a quick trick here by swiftly left and right clicking, we can swap that slime block out for a honey block, which you will see does not have the same effect. If anything, the honey block actually sucks the chicken into it for a second, and that is part of the fun of honey blocks. They will actually bring entities with them. Just for demonstration purposes, I'll set up a honey block with a sticky piston on its side, and it looks like the chicken is already interested in giving this one a try. We can walk the chicken out onto this platform of honey blocks, where it'll sink into the honey ever so slightly. Let's see if we can try and drag it a little bit further over. That'll do, I think. Now, if we activate the sticky piston with a button, you will see that the chicken actually moves with the honey blocks. But then if we do the same thing with slime blocks here, you'll notice that the chicken doesn't move with the slime blocks. In fact, it ends up falling into the head of the piston as it gets pushed out. If we want to have some real fun, what we need to do is create a little staircase out of the sand blocks I've got here. We'll walk the chicken up here so it's standing in front of the slime block, and we'll activate the piston, which will actually <laughs> launch the chicken a little bit away. And it's actually moved the sand block the chicken was standing on because when the piston retracts, the slime block brings that sand block with it. But we can demonstrate this as the player as well. We can get pushed off here by the slime block, and that certainly pushes you a little further than a regular sticky piston would. This will also affect you if you're in midair at the time, so we can jump up here and hit that button to be launched back to where the chicken landed. But since I mentioned pushing blocks around with slime blocks, that's one of the other things that we need to note, and one of the other things that makes honey blocks and 
and slime blocks kind of similar, is that blocks that are attached to any of the faces of a slime block will be pushed along with it when it is pushed by a piston or moved by any other means. Obviously once they've been pushed along with the slime block, those blocks will still be under the usual restrictions. So for example in this case, if we end up pushing these two sand blocks with the slime block here, that sand block back there is still going to fall, affected by gravity, where the one on top will remain attached to the face of the slime block. And naturally if we add more slime blocks to this, each of those is going to be pushed and pulled by the same piston movement, although of course we have to adhere to the piston block push limit. The maximum any piston can push is 12 blocks, so we have 13 blocks attached here since there are 6 slime blocks, 6 sand blocks, and 1 block of dirt underneath there. Well, it's grass now, actually. <laughs> if we press this button now, nothing is going to happen. The piston simply will not extend because it is trying to push too many blocks. The slime blocks do not convey any additional pushing power, so we have to remove that 13th block from the equation in order to have the slime blocks push along with the blocks that they have attached. It is worth noting though that with a fast enough pulse, a one tick pulse to this piston will actually disconnect the sticky piston head from the blocks that it is attached to, and that includes slime blocks. So the piston can be disconnected from the slime blocks, which allows for all kinds of neat stuff we can do with slime blocks later. An additional note though, that behavior and a couple of other behaviors we'll look at later in this video are not possible in Minecraft Bedrock Edition, since pistons there behave a little differently, and it's not possible to give them a short enough redstone pulse that they will eject the blocks that are attached to them. We should also talk about blocks which are not pushable or pullable, since those will be really important to remember when it comes to setting up anything involving slime blocks and flying machines which can be made using slime blocks. There are a few really important ones of these and various categories that they fall into. My favorites personally are obsidian, furnaces or other things with an interface, a GUI like this, say for example dispensers or droppers, leaves, honey blocks, and glazed terracotta. Let's start with obsidian. Obsidian is not a pushable block. Obsidian is one of the hardest blocks in the game. It takes a little while to remove, and it cannot be moved by pistons. The same is true of crying obsidian and anything else that is made out of obsidian, like ender chests or respawn anchors. And obsidian ends up being really important to slime block contraptions because it's one of those blocks that will allow the slime block to move adjacent to the obsidian without moving the obsidian block itself. So if you need a solid block to stay as part of a circuit that involves a slime block, the slime block can slide over or around the obsidian without moving it at all. The same is true of furnaces and other GUI blocks in Minecraft Java Edition, but this may vary in Minecraft Bedrock Edition because there are some blocks which can be moved around. Like you can move chests and hoppers with pistons in Minecraft Bedrock Edition, but you cannot do that on Java Edition because of differences in the way they are coded. So furnaces can often be a cheaper and easier to move alternative to obsidian when you're dealing with slime block contraptions on Java Edition. But on Bedrock Edition, you might need to resort to something like obsidian, which is slightly more expensive to use and slightly more of a pain if you misplace a block. Now leaves are an interesting case because leaves break when they are pushed. In this case, it broke can drop some sticks, most of the time they'll break and they won't drop anything at all. But if the block is attached to the face of a slime block, it cannot be pulled. So it cannot be pushed since it will break, and it cannot be pulled, it will simply stay where it is as a solid block of leaves. So that has a certain amount of uses, especially where you want to use leaves in certain situations. Let's move on to honey blocks. Honey blocks are another really interesting one because they have similar properties to slime blocks. But honey blocks and slime blocks do not attach to each other, so they can basically operate independently independently of each other. By setting up a button on this block below, we can activate the piston that is attached to the honey blocks. And if we activate the piston above, it's actually going to activate both of these pistons because of that Java quasi-connectivity property. But if I remove this piston here, we can see that it just activates the row of slime blocks. And that allows honey and slime blocks to both push sets of blocks around so that we can set them up in contraptions like automatic doors, where we want large areas of blocks to move, but we can't rely on connecting all of those blocks to slime and honey because of that piston push limit of 12 blocks that we mentioned earlier. So honey blocks were a really important addition to the game because they allowed for us to take those slime block contraptions to the next level. Finally, we have glazed terracotta, and I'm using the magenta glazed terracotta here, but any block of glazed terracotta will have the same properties. Glazed terracotta is interesting 
interesting in that it can be pushed, but cannot be pulled. So we can push it using a piston. It's not going to be resistant to that in the way that obsidian and furnaces were. But now if we set up a slime or a honey block over the top of that with the piston head attached to it, it's not going to bring the glazed terracotta block with it either. So that allows for glazed terracotta blocks to be used kind of subtly because they can be pushed if they are at the front of a piston contraption like this, but they will not be returned with the slime block. So those are a few interesting block interactions with honey and slime blocks that it's worth bearing in mind when you set up some redstone contraptions. But in my opinion, by far one of the coolest things we can do with slime blocks and redstone is to combine them to make a flying machine. And we can do this with only minimal supplies. The minimum you would need to make a flying machine is two pistons, two slime blocks, and two observers. You start by placing a piston horizontally with a slime block attached to it, and then you attach another sticky piston to the side of that and have a slime block attached to the head of that one. This creates a mechanism that can travel in two different directions. The piston that pushes out this slime block is going to bring this piston along with it. And then as that retracts, this piston is going to fire, dragging this slime block and this piston back with it. And the way we power these is with observers, either facing upwards so that the redstone output points directly down into the slime block and then anything that changes in front of this observer face ends up powering the system. Or we can take advantage of the Java quasi-connectivity behavior and have it power the air block above each of these pistons. We also need to make sure that the slime block isn't attached to too many other blocks, otherwise it's going to drag those blocks along with it. But if you want to use these mechanisms to bring some entities with you, you can set up something like this, where we have a solid block attached here, and a row of slime blocks attached to the one that's getting pushed by the piston. We'll put another solid block here, and let's put an armor stand in between those two. Now if I place something temporary like a torch on this observer, the flying machine is going to get set off and it's dragging the armor stand along with it. And this flying slime block machine will travel until it hits an obstacle it is no longer able to push, which since I've fired this from the top of a mountain, <laughs> is probably going to take a while. Of course, once it leaves the radius of the player's loaded area, once it reaches the edge of your simulation distance, the redstone components are going to stop working. So it's not going to leave the area entirely and continue throughout the world forever because it needs to be loaded in order to do that. But in the meantime, just so this thing doesn't drift off into the sky somewhere else, I'm gonna float down here and try to place an obsidian block attached to one of these. There we go. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to place stuff on something when it's moving like that. But the idea, of course, here is that we have locked up the flying machine by preventing it from pushing any of the components any further. And if we wanted to, we could simply place a torch attached to this observer and <laughs> there we go. The flying machine is sent back off towards its point of origin. And naturally, if we leave an unpushable block like some obsidian or a furnace here, we can stop the flying machine in its tracks once it reaches this point. And you can even set up a redstone mechanism that triggers the observer a second time, sending it back, allowing you to create a two-way shuttle. Although it looks like the flying machine is actually one block above the obsidian that I've placed, so <laughs> let's make sure that it's actually going to stop the machine. And there we go, it comes to a halt right here, returning the armor stand without having dropped it into the fields below. And in theory, it should be possible to build exactly the same flying machine using honey blocks, since their behavior is similar to that of slime blocks. But there is one caveat to this, which is that the observers have to be facing outwards and rely on quasi-connectivity to fire these pistons, because honey blocks are counted as a non-solid block which will not conduct redstone power, whereas slime blocks, for the purposes of conducting redstone power are treated as a solid block. And that's how come you can have the observers facing upwards with the redstone output pointing downwards, and that's what allows the slime blocks to end up powering the pistons adjacent to them. And there will be some situations in which it is much more convenient for whatever farm you're building with the slime block flying machines that you have the observers pointing upwards. I can think of a couple of examples, which we might get into later in the series. But for now, with honey blocks, we can, of course, take advantage of the fact that honey blocks are better at transporting entities because the entities will stick to the top face of the honey blocks. So if we launch this flying machine now, we're actually flying along with it. And we get a much more stable experience of the flying machine than we would get if we were using slime blocks, because slime blocks would naturally have you bouncing around. Whereas with honey blocks, you actually stick to the honey blocks themselves. And while it might seem kind of strange seeing the observers move around like this, you are moving a block at a time away from your origin point and towards some sort of distant destination. This also makes it slightly easier to stop the machine, since all we need to do is place an observer there. Although at this point, the machine has separated, and so we would need to make 
make sure it gets retracted one more time in order to send it back in the opposite direction. And the whole reason this works the way it does is that the observers are detecting that their position has changed, and that counts as a block update which triggers the observer's redstone output. Naturally, once one observer has detected this change and fired the piston for a single tick, that's going to move the other observer which is going to fire that observer's piston for a single tick, and the cycle simply repeats over and over again, creating a machine that can travel in a straight line. <laughs> this is probably a flying machine at its most basic. There are hundreds of flying machine designs out there that are capable of all sorts of really cool stuff, and that's a technology we're going to be using several times throughout the series later in order to achieve some pretty spectacular results with certain contraptions. For example, instead of having these sugarcane and bamboo farms that we've got set up over here, we could create a field of bamboo and have a flying machine with two sweeper arms break the bamboo as it passes, allowing us to harvest a huge field of bamboo instead of just relying on a 1x8 strip of bamboo here in this box. We have a couple of patches of flower forest nearby, which can be flattened and bone mealed in order to produce a variety of flowers. Basically, if we can find the right spot, we can get every single variety of flower that it's possible to grow in a flower forest and have a slime block flying machine sweep across those in order to harvest all of the flowers and collect them all in a specific point. And then we have access to a ton of different dyes just by growing flowers in a certain biome. Alternatively, if you want a flower monoculture, if you just want one type of flower, say if we wanted to harvest blue dye from this meadow over and over again, you could apply the same theory here, but with just the cornflowers that grow. Bone meal the grass, sweep all of the flowers off into a water stream that's going to carry them into a hopper and a collection mechanism, probably harvest a bunch of wheat seeds from the grass that would grow along with it, but that slime block flying machine technology is at the center of it. Slime blocks can even be used in machines which are designed to blow up large areas of the world using TNT, although that gets into TNT duplication mechanics, which are a contentious subject in the Java Edition community. It's a little bit different on Bedrock Edition, where dispensers and other containers can be pushed by pistons and slime blocks, but that's a slightly different story for another time. We're not going to cover that in today's episode. Instead, I'm going to turn one of these blank stone walls here in my storage system into a secret door, where we can activate it using a button or some other kind of trigger nearby, and slime blocks and honey blocks are going to work in tandem to retract the stone blocks into the wall and allow us to walk through into a secret area. So naturally, the first thing we need to do is remove a bunch of blocks here so we have some space to work. And I'm going to put the magenta glazed terracotta here on the floor, both as a reminder of which direction these blocks are going to go, but also so that it does not attach to the slime blocks when we start pushing and pulling blocks around here. So the blocks of the door are going to be on top of here, and we want to have the slime blocks behind that attached to the blocks of the door. We're actually going to be pulling an area of four blocks at once, so we effectively want these slime blocks to be arranged in a pad of four behind there. We also need to make sure that the slime blocks are not not attached to anything else behind that, so we want to fill in the blocks behind here with something that cannot be pulled around, like the magenta glazed terracotta that we've been using, or some furnaces or some obsidian, or something like that. Then a couple of blocks away, we're going to be placing two pistons attached to each other like so, and we're going to be placing two observers facing down away from these pistons, and this will create what is called a double piston extender. This is probably the simplest form of double piston extender, because all we require is two pistons, two observers over the top, and some sort of redstone power source powering this block here. Notably, it will need to do that from on top of this block, so that the button when we press it here, or the redstone dust when it triggers, triggers both of these observers. But if we end up pressing this button now, it extends both pistons and then retracts both pistons, pulling the blocks back out of the way of this area where we've set up the door. Hmm, and unfortunately, when we try to push it back, it brings this observer with it, so we might need to rearrange this slightly. I'm going to adjust the design of the door here so it's basically a series of sliding bars instead of a solid wall, and that will give us a much easier time attaching some blocks to this slime, because right here we have the acacia logs attached to the front face of the slime block and the stone one block back but attached to the top face of the slime block. Since that is six blocks plus the three there, that's only nine blocks, which means our piston double extenders can move these quite easily. And we're going to mirror the same mechanism on the opposite side but with honey, since the honey blocks will not connect to the slime blocks and that will allow these two to be retracted into the wall that way 
instead of attaching them to the slime blocks over here. So we'll do the same thing on this side with the two sticky pistons and two observers. And for simplicity's sake, we're just going to trigger this using a button in the floor here. So underneath the floor, I'm going to run a string of redstone wire. That's going to end in front of this observer here, but it will power the block below as well. So now if I press this button, we should see that side retract. Perfect. We just need to mirror that on the opposite side now. We're going to put a stone block in there to make sure that this looks closed off from the outside. We'll do the same thing up here as well, and that section is going to move in a minute. But for now, I should be able to press this button, and both of those end up retracting, allowing me through. Although since the entrance here is an odd number wide, and we don't have a triple extender on this side, it is going to leave one line of blocks over here on the left, and that's just something we'll have to deal with. If the asymmetry of that bothers you, leave a central pillar down the middle here and have both sides retract two blocks from the left and the right, and then just choose which direction you're going to walk through as you enter. But then the cool thing about these piston double extenders is that we can stack them up. We can have another set of observers facing that way. We'll have two more sticky pistons over here as well, and that will retract another set of blocks here. But in the process of doing that, we do need to make sure that this set of observers up here gets powered as well. So I've simply continued the redstone dust up this staircase and it will end in front of this observer, wrapping up around those blocks. And unfortunately there we ran into a bit of an issue, and this is where troubleshooting and testing with these slime block piston doors is usually a really good idea, because it's not possible, unfortunately, to have both of these slime blocks in here and have that double piston extender push in the same way that it normally does, because it will push all the way in with those slime blocks attached, and when it tries to retract those blocks, it's fine but then when it tries to push the next load out, this piston back here is trying to push more than 12 blocks, and so it only activates the piston in front, which is only pushing 12. That extra piston in there ends up pushing 13, because these slime blocks cannot tell whether or not the slime blocks below them are designed to move these blocks here or not. So it's not distributing the load evenly between these slime blocks, it is calculating from scratch whether or not these slime blocks have 12 blocks attached that they might need to move. And so when we try and press this button again, the door gets stuck there and actually retracts once because it's only this piston that is firing, not the one behind it. I thought this might be a timing issue, so I actually delayed the circuit and I tried rewiring it a couple of times, but it genuinely is the piston push limit that's coming into play there. So we are actually going to remove the two slime blocks from here. We're going to remove this section of the door entirely, and we're going to leave a pillar up the center, which is going to effectively split this door into a left-hand segment and a right-hand segment. I still like that idea. I think this is going to be a cool design, so we can just leave a dark oak log pillar in the center here, and then when we open and close the door, it's going to open and close around this section of the build. I like that, actually. And coming to terms with these limitations or figuring out how you can work around them is one of the things that will make you a better technical Minecrafter. Now we've got two sets of piston extenders on either side, and the door will open and close like so. So I might add a third layer of piston extenders just so it closes up at the top there as well, but we've only got two more blocks left to fill the gaps, and I think it'll look really cool if the acacia logs slide in from the side here. Once again, I might need to adjust the position of these repeaters so we can make the redstone signal reach. And in the case of this patch over here, I am going to have to terraform the hillside here slightly just to make sure it doesn't cut off the redstone and that the whole thing isn't exposed to the air. But now we've done that, let's see this door in action. Oh yeah, I like that. That looks cool. Now I have to figure out something even cooler to go behind this. <laughs> but that's where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this introductory look at slime blocks and what we can do with them. And trust me, there's going to be a lot more slime block action coming up in future episodes. For now, though, that is where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.